Remember GM's short box Duramax? No, because they never made one. So we'll create our own through metal surgery. You know, the coolest thing about the American pickup truck is the variety of configurations you can get. I mean, for a cab, you can get anywhere from a regular, extended, crew, or even the mega cab. Beds range in length anywhere from five to eight and a half feet long. You can choose between two or four wheel drive, and you even have gas and diesel engine options. But for sport truck guys like me, our holy grail can be one truck and one truck only, the regular cab short bed, and we've built a few of them. Most recently, our 71 C10. And of course, Project Night Train. A short bed and standard cab is the lightest combination pickup, which means it is typically faster and handles better. Plus, I think they look the best. Now, usually in the diesel world, guys typically go the other direction and want larger cabs with longer beds, especially if your rig helps put bread on the table. But big means heavy, and heavy means it's harder to stop and it won't handle as good. We want a rig that both the diesel and sport truck guys will love. This is our 2003 regular cab, long bed, diesel powered Silverado. But this was actually the shortest configuration of 2500 or 3500 series truck you could buy from GM. But eight foot is too long. Turns out we want to build something that GM never made, a regular cab, short bed, diesel truck. So if you can't buy it, what's the next best thing? Build it yourself. That's right. We're going to shorten this truck down to make it one of the sportiest Duramax powered Silverados you'll see rolling down the road. And we're going to call it Project Supermax. And the best part is we're going to accomplish this using all factory parts. So we'll get this bed yanked off, show you what we mean. First, we have to remove this exhaust stack that the previous owner installed. Then, Jeremy can remove the roll pan. There are just a few bolts that hold the bed onto the frame that have to be removed. Then, we can disconnect the gas filler neck. Then, the entire bed. You all clear? Any wires or anything hanging down? Nope, clear, good to go. All right. It can be lifted off the frame. To make the coming work a little easier, first, we'll roll the truck outside and with some help from Gunk Degreaser and our pressure washer, we'll clean up the frame, removing loose dirt, old paint, and some of the rust scale. And we've got our frame all cleaned up and we're back in the shop. And you can see from the factory, there's a seam in the frame about a third of the way back. And this is where the two pieces are welded together. Now, this is what we'll take advantage of to convert our long bed into a short bed. Now, on GM trucks of this era, long wheelbase frames and short wheelbase frames are very similar other than the added length right here. So this means we can modify the frame and make it look completely OEM. Probably the coolest part about this whole conversion is you can do it all using factory or original parts. So we started out by going to the junkyard and grabbing this 26 gallon fuel tank. Now the donor vehicle has to be an extended cab or four door short bed HD Silverado. Now you can do this conversion on many different years of trucks. Just make sure the donor has the same engine family as yours. This is an LB7 tank, which fits our LB7 truck. The next thing we need are some spring hangers. So we called up our local dealership. These are again for an extended cab or four door short bed Silverado. We grab the hangers and the brackets. And our conversion starts by disassembling the back end of that frame. We'll prep for surgery by removing everything connected to the frame, including the shocks and drive shaft. The straps that hold the fuel tank are removed, so we can drop the tank and put it in our swap meat pile. We'll replace it with a junkyard fuel tank that'll fit our soon to be short bed frame. Unbolt the rear shackles and the spring mount up front. The axle is loose, but before we roll it out of the way, the leaf springs have to be unbolted and removed. All right. We'll cut off this homemade gooseneck hitch since we don't plan on towing that much and quite frankly, we don't trust the rusted metal. Cut it. Nasty. Cutting off the front spring hangers can be a chore. 
These are an aftermarket hanger that somebody welded to the frame, making our job quite a bit harder. Remember, always wear the proper safety equipment. Throw some sparks and stick with it, and they'll eventually come off. Once everything is removed, grind all the welds smooth. Next, is it measure once, cut twice? We're right in the middle of dissecting our 2003 Duramax. Now, not too long ago, we made a trip out to the junkyard and pulled some measurements and took some notes on a short wheelbase frame. We came back to the shop and compared them to our long wheelbase. Turns out we need to cut about 14 inches out of this thing. Now, this is a very important cut, so remember the old saying, measure twice and cut once. And anytime you do any type of framework like this, make sure the frame is square and level. That's very important. So the next thing for us to do is pull a couple of measurements, make a mark, and cut this baby up. I can mark it three feet. Not until our lines are marked and the math is checked, we can begin dissecting the frame. Now we'll do this using four and a half inch cutoff wheels on angle grinders. <laughs> well, no turning back now. <laughs> We're committed. Hey, nothing better than that. With right? the frame separated, now we can work at removing the leftover pieces from the front half of the frame. This will prepare the two halves to slide together exactly like they would have from the factory. To get this done, we're using various tools. Everything from air chisels to reciprocating saws. It's tedious work, but when it's done properly, it'll ensure a strong overlap seam that looks just like the original. Look at all that rust. Think if we wouldn't have gotten a hold of this truck, wouldn't have had a very long life left. We want to clean up the frame, so the wire wheel makes quick work of the rust and scale and prepares the surface for coating later on. After getting our hands just a little bit dirty, the two halves of the frame are cleaned up and just about ready to weld back together. But first we need to mount the front spring hanger so we have a reference point to measure from. But check this out. This is the uppermost bolt hole for the factory long bed spring hanger. Now, whether this is by pure luck or just by design, this bolt hole actually gets reused to correctly locate the new factory short bed spring hanger. Pretty cool. The first bolt is secured, so the rest of the holes can be drilled. This is so everything lines up the first time around. Sliding the two halves of the frame together, you can see how the overlapped joint will make a very strong connection. None of this is guesswork. All right, we're looking for 63 and a quarter. We are 63 and three quarters, so bump it in a little. The research we did at the junkyard on the short box frame really pays off here. And we'll take our time double and triple checking our measurements, making sure she's level and oh, square. Yep. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna put it right there. Right on the money. Perfect. Weld it up. And once it's set, I can lay down some tack welds. Obviously, when you're doing framework like this, a proper weld is necessary because we need this frame to take some abuse. Not only that, it's all about safety now. You need to have a little bit of experience welding to do a job like this, but if you don't, that's not a big deal. You can call your local welding shop. They'll send a guy down and burn it in for you. Welding is just like anything. Lots of practice. We've cut a lot of metal out of this frame, which gives us some good material to practice on, and I always do this before making my initial welds. Now, I set up the welder and made a few test passes. Now, on the first one, we were a little bit hot. That's why the weld is caved in. On the second one, I dialed it back a bit, and we got a little bit better, but I'm not happy with that. And on the third one, I set it up at recommended settings, and it was nearly perfect, so we'll run with that. Now, through the years, we've shown you guys a lot of welding tips and tricks, so if you want to learn more, check out PowerNationTV.com. Now, since our frame is 3 16ths of an inch thick, we probably won't have to worry about any warpage. But I still like to run short welds and let it cool as I go. And for you guys at home with a little 110 welder, probably not going to cut it on a job like this. Next, a shorter frame needs a shorter bed. 
We're back on Truck Tech, finishing up the metal surgery on our short wheelbase conversion. We need to reattach the second row bed mount. They're about two and a half inches farther forward than the original. After five inches are removed from the back of the frame to clear the shorter bed, we can begin to prep it for paint. All right, we've got the frame all welded up, bed mounts relocated, frames all wire brushed and ready for a coating. Now for that, I'm going to be using Duplicolor's Rust Barrier. Now, I showed you guys this product last season when I applied it to the bottom of our C10 cab using an HVLP spray gun, and I've been really impressed with how well it's held up. But for this frame, we're going to do something a little bit different. Duplicolor actually recommends applying this product with a brush. Now, normally I wouldn't apply anything with a brush, but since they recommend it, I'm going to give it a shot, see what I think about it, and there's a couple of reasons why. One, this is by no means a show truck. We don't need a perfect slicked out finish on this thing, and it's going to take a ton of abuse. Secondly, our paint booth is full of parts, so applying the product this way is going to cut down on any overspray we'll have in the shop, so we're not moving out toolboxes and masking everything up. Heck, we don't even have to mask up the cab. This is a very clean way to apply this product. The first thing I'm doing is wiping down the frame with wax and grease remover to make sure the frame is clean from any oil or dirt. Then I can brush it right on over the rusted bare metal. It's a one-step process. You don't need any rust preventative or treatment, and it leaves our frame with an impact-resistant rubberized coating. Two coats took just a couple hours. As the frame's drying, it's actually looking really good, and there's not near as many brush strokes as I thought there would be. This product is perfect for you guys that don't have an air compressor, don't have a paint gun, or you've never painted before. So brushing it on is the way to go. We picked up a six and a half foot bed from our local junkyard and we're gonna set it on to see how our regular cab short bed diesel looks. If you want one of these on your own, you'll have to build it. Project Supermax is back to start our incremental performance upgrades because you don't become super all at once. Stage one includes a four inch exhaust, bigger cooler and extreme tune. Plus, how to fix a bad body repair. That and more right now on Truck Tech. Today, we have Project Supermax in the shop. It's our 2003 regular cab short bed 2500 HD Silverado. Now it's powered by the LB7 6.6 liter Duramax. And right now, there's nothing too special about this power plant. It's bone stock other than the cold air intake that the previous owner installed, just a little bit crooked. But what is special is what we're about to do to this diesel power plant. We've already done something pretty cool that might have had some of you scratching your heads. This truck started as a long bed, not really sexy at all which is why we shorten the wheelbase by chopping 14 inches out of the frame. You see, GM never offered a short box diesel pickup. So what did all of this work buy us? Style, I mean, shorter is cooler and the truck is now lighter, but with the strength of the three quarter ton frame. So the only thing left for us to do now is to build on the strength of the LB7 with some serious performance upgrades. We know that most people won't transform a diesel truck from bone stock to a thousand horsepower racer in one simple step. It's a very complicated process that involves a lot of expense and a lot of time. So we're going to build our LB7 in three distinct power stages to reach that crazy horsepower goal. Now stage one represents what most people do when they first buy a diesel truck. We have a goal of about 400 horsepower, and to reach that goal, we're gonna make changes to the intake and exhaust system to make airflow into and out of the engine much more efficient. But most of the power gains are actually gonna come from the computer programmer, so we'll throw on a tuner. Now, anytime you add more power to an engine, you also wanna add some gauges just to make sure everything inside the engine is happy. Now, stage one will be a pretty fun street truck, but stage two, now that's where things really start to get fun. Our LB7 has a factory rating of around 300 horsepower, but our goal for stage two is 650 at the wheels. So to meet that goal, we're gonna have to yank out the factory turbocharger and replace it with an upgraded compression wheel. Now we also have to upgrade the transmission. 
The Allison 1000 is very strong, but once you get to about 150 horsepower over stock, it just will start to slip and it won't cut it anymore. So we'll have to address that. We'll also add a lift pump and probably some manifolds and up pipes. 650 horsepower is great for any hot street truck, but if you really want to go drag racing, then stage three is where you need to be at 1,000 horsepower or more. Now to meet that goal, we're going to have to yank out that LB7 and upgrade the pistons and rods to much stronger pieces. We'll also have to add twin compound turbochargers and twin CP3 high pressure fuel injection pumps. We'll probably throw on some cylinder heads while we're in there, but I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Today we're going to start by changing all the parts for stage one. Back her up. We're going to begin with the exhaust, which means the truck needs to be up on the lift. The original muffler is long gone, so we're going to remove the rest of the stock system by disconnecting the V-band near the starter. The factory exhaust is three and a half inches in diameter, but we need to do better than that. One of the more restricted parts of the exhaust system can be the piece that runs from the turbo down toward the transmission. Now, this is called the downpipe. It's a pain to get to because it runs between the engine and firewall. With some persistence and a couple of bloody knuckles, it'll come out. The factory downpipe is reduced in size to allow for a little bit of room between the engine and firewall, but there is room for a larger pipe. Now we grabbed this one from Summit Racing. It's a direct bolt on that ceramic coated and already heat wrapped to protect anything around it. Side by side, you can see the true three inch diameter will maximize exhaust flow. We need to get the exhaust from the downpipe to the tailpipe. And for that, we went to Flowmaster and picked up a four inch downpipe back dual exit American Thunder exhaust system. This will give us better horsepower, better fuel mileage, and most importantly, lower exhaust gas temperatures. This is made from stainless steel, which means it'll give you a lifetime of good looks. And the polished tips will work perfectly with the theme we have planned for our sport truck. Now we have a modified wheelbase, which means no out of the box exhaust system is going to work for us. But this one is intended for extended and crew cab Duramax, so it's very close. Now most of the extra length we're going to have to cut from this middle section of pipe. The front pipe slides into place and attaches to the new downpipe with the original V-band clamp. New urethane isolators will attach to the factory hanger and the passenger side tailpipe goes into place. Jeremy will support the front with a stand, then it's on to the driver's side, which attaches using a new mount in an existing hole. The muffler can then slide into place. Ahead, Jeremy will put this bad repair to bed and show you how to fix it right. We're back on Truck Tech, custom fitting our new 4-inch Flowmaster American Thunder exhaust to our shortened frame. With everything lined up the way I want it, I can tack the tubes into place. Now we have the two halves of the system installed, and believe it or not, this little guy right here is actually the muffler. On a diesel engine like this, the turbocharger removes a lot of the exhaust noise, so the muffler doesn't have to be as big. Now with the two parts installed, they're actually a little bit closer together than I originally thought. There's only about an 8 inch section that I have to fill. So what I think I'm going to do is make some cuts, move the muffler a little bit farther to the rear, add about a 15 degree bend to the front pipe, and hopefully they'll connect up together. I'll remove the tailpipes and weld them together to prevent them from moving around to keep alignment perfect. Then trim the excess length and reinstall them on the truck for good, along with a muffler in its new location farther back. Remember, this 4 inch system is for a long bed truck and all the bends are there to make it work on our shortened frame. Another tip, anytime you work on custom exhaust, save the leftover pieces. They could come in handy someday. With the exhaust connected, we'll lower this truck and hear how it sounds. Oh, 
nothing like a Duramax. We needed the bed on while LT was lining up the exhaust. And with it now finished, we can yank it off so I can get to work. Remember, this was a long bed Duramax pickup that we converted to a short bed, something that GM never produced. And right here is where we cut 14 inches out of the frame to make it happen. Now, we could have taken a Duramax diesel engine and swapped it into a short bed truck and not had to cut a thing, but then we wouldn't have gotten the thicker frame, the big three quarter ton rear axle, the heavier suspension, the eight lug bolt pattern, and heavier brakes. And to do this conversion, we didn't need a single aftermarket part. Even the fuel tank we pulled from a short bed pickup fits perfectly in the frame rails. We went through a handful of junkyards trying to find a short bed for our truck, and most of them we found were pretty smashed due to wrecks. Now this is the best of two that we found, and it's still not that great. It's got quite a few dents in it, and the way they stored this thing at the yard, they bent all four corners. But this bed's also had a little bit of work done to it, and I'll get it up in there and show you what I'm talking about. All right, here is an example of a temporary repair. Obviously there was a dent in the lower bed corner and whoever repaired this thing did the old screw slide hammer method to yank this thing back out. Problem is, they didn't weld up any of the holes, they just slapped filler on there, which is why you see all these fingers sticking out at you. So I'll take my knife and scrape some of this filler away. And this is exactly what would happen if a rock slung up and knocked some of this hardened filler off. Next thing you know, you've got holes in your panel and you're having to rework it. And that's exactly what I'm going to do after I get the bed down on the stand. When it comes to performance, increased airflow is the name of the game. And our LB7 is no different. Now we've already taken care of the exhaust side of the equation, so it's time to move on to the intake. Now our truck, like most diesels, is equipped with a turbocharger, which forces more air into the engine. But unfortunately, that process also creates a lot of heat. Our truck is equipped with an intercooler, which will remove a lot of that extra heat, but unfortunately it's not super efficient and it won't hold together when it comes to higher boost pressure like we plan on achieving in stage two and stage three. So we went to Summit Racing and picked up this Mishimoto high flow intercooler kit. Now the core is substantially thicker and larger than stock, but it still drops right into the factory location. It also comes with these polished aluminum high flow intercooler pipes as well as all the necessary silicone couplers required to complete the installation. I've got to get some parts out of the way to make room for our larger intercooler. But why go through the trouble for this upgrade? When air from a turbo is compressed, it gets hot pretty quickly. And as the temperature climbs, the oxygen density drops. Cooler oxygen enriched air since the engine is way more efficient improving combustion. Now I can separate the radiator from the intercooler and lift out the stock restrictive cooler. The larger Mishimoto intercooler slides into place. Ours is specific for the 6.6 .6 Duramax, but log on to summitracing.com for your application. After a little persuasion, the radiator reattaches to our new intercooler. We'll install the beam to secure the whole package, then remove the stock cooler tubes and install the three inch polish tubes and secure the coupler. From there, it's a simple matter of reinstalling the parts we had to take off. Later on, our stage one performance upgrades are proven on the dyno. The first thing I'm doing is stripping the paint and old filler to get down to bare metal. It's a pretty quick job with this eight inch Matco sander. And 36 grit takes off all the hardened filler. After that, a screwdriver takes care of the rest. With the area cleaned of all the filler, I can start working the distorted metal back straight. I'm starting out with a slapping spoon on the back side of the panel and a dolly. Patience here is key. It doesn't take much to move the metal and you definitely don't want to go too far. Now I'm moving on to a hammer and dolly to smooth out the metal. You know, 40 or 50 years ago, drilling holes in a panel to pull a dent was considered a proper repair. But I'd never slap filler over the holes and call it a day. Whoever did this should have at least welded up the holes, which is what I'm going to do, but carefully. 
The guy before me ground so much metal away that the panel is paper thin. I'll turn the MIG all the way down so I don't burn through. Small spot welds will do the trick until all the holes are covered. And to clean up the welds, I'm using a 36 grit 3 inch roll lock on an angle grinder. Now I'm only flattening out the weld since this area is so thin. Okay, now we're ready to move on to the top of the bed. You can see this thing took a pretty good hit, and this is what we call direct damage because it's exactly where it took the impact. Now, a lot of guys would filler work this out and think they've got it, but in reality, you don't. Because when you get a dent like this, it draws the metal toward the dent, shrinking the metal. It creates little waves and wiggles out here called indirect damage. Let me give you an example. If I lay this sheet of paper up here and I put a dent in it, you see what it does. It wants to pull toward the dent. So if we take the time and properly metal work this out, you can see how it flattens back out. So the panel will want to go back to its original state and it minimizes the amount of filler work we'll have to do. The first step is to strip the paint from the area, since we'll need bare metal for the next step. Now I can start welding on studs with my Matco stud gun. I'll work from the outside in, slowly massaging the dent back out with the slide hammer. If you don't own a stud gun, you can always get yourself an inexpensive slide hammer and some sheet metal screws. Just remember, weld up the holes. I'll repeat this process, working my way toward the center of the dent. I'm also lightly tapping the metal with a body hammer while pulling up. This helps pull the metal back into place. As Jeremy finishes up the bodywork on the bed of Project Supermax, I'm nearly done with stage one of the performance modifications. And the last thing we need is a cold air intake. This is the Bully Dog Rapid Flow, and it looks and fits just like a factory piece, but it flows 10% more air, and more importantly, reduces the inlet air temperatures by 10 degrees. That's going to go a long way to the power and efficiency of our LB7. Now, the last little piece of the puzzle is this guy right here, a boost increase valve we got from Summit Racing. From the factory, the LB7 puts down somewhere around 20 pounds of boost, and this is going to raise that closer to 30 which means more airflow and most importantly, a lot more power. There are a lot of intake systems on the market that are essentially a filter on the end of a tube, but you really can't call that a cold air intake because it sucks in warm air from the engine bay. The Bully Dog Rapid Flow is a true cold air intake because the filter sits inside a box and draws cold air in from outside the vehicle. And remember, the colder the air, the more power you'll make. We install gauges on every performance build we do at Truck Tech. They'll quickly let you know if something's going wrong inside your engine. The two most important gauges for a turbo diesel engine are boost and exhaust gas temperature. So we went to Summit Racing and picked up the 0 to 60 PSI mechanical factory match style boost gauge as well as the 0 to 2000 degree Fahrenheit pyrometer. We also grabbed this nifty pillar pod to mount them in. Next, with the gauges installed, Supermax heads to the dyno. All the hard parts we have installed so far on our 03 Duramax will increase performance and economy a little bit, but the real secret to upping the power lies within tuning the computer. We made a baseline run on the Duramax's stock computer that yielded 238 horsepower and 430 pound-feet of torque, really close to the factory numbers at the crank. The real trick to adding power to a diesel engine is getting inside its computer, adding more fuel, and adjusting the injection timing. This is the Bully Dog GT Platinum. It's a powerful programmer that lets you switch power levels on the fly, from stock to towing to performance and, of course, extreme. But it's more than just a programmer. It's also a monitoring tool as well as a scan tool that lets you read and clear DTC codes. We'll get started by switching it to the tow tune and see how much more power we can get from our LB7. The Bully Dog GT Platinum works with GM, Ford, and Dodge Diesel and comes with an SD card preloaded with tunes for your specific truck.
With the GT's towing tune installed, our Duramax gained an additional 54 horsepower and added 100 pound-feet of torque. And that's just the first tune. We'll skip the second tune and go straight to the big daddy, the extreme tune. And see how much power this bully dog tuner can pull out of our Duramax. Our final spin yielded 374 horsepower and 684 for torque. That's an overall gain of 136 horses and 254 pounds of torque over stock. And we're not done yet. Stage two will try and double these numbers with additional upgrades, including a bigger turbo, high flow manifolds and up pipes, and fuel system upgrades. If you own a 99 to 07 Silverado and live anywhere near the Rust Belt, then you recognize this. But our rust keeps on going. We'll take you step by step through the process of rocker and cab corner replacement. That and more today on Truck Tech. Today, we have Project Supermax back in the shop, although we probably should have named it Project Honey, I Shrunk the Duramax. That's because we took this 2003 long wheelbase Silverado diesel pickup and converted it to a short bed by chopping the frame. That's pretty much just because we could. Yeah. We sourced a junkyard short bed that we reworked and it will go back on today, at least temporarily. Our main focus will be on diesel performance. The last time you saw our Chevy, it was strapped to the chassis dyno over at engine power, where it laid down 374 horsepower and 684 pounds of torque to the rear wheels. We have a lot more power to pull out of the Duramax in the future, but first, we need to take care of some cosmetics. When it comes to painting a late model truck, there's quite a few steps, especially if you plan to change the color. But before we can get to any of that, We've got a little bit of rust we're going to have to deal with, and what gave it away for me is when we first checked out this truck, someone sprayed bed liner from the style line down. Now, you normally wouldn't do that for looks, so let's check it out and see what we've got. Well, you can see we've already got a hole down here, so it's not looking good. Let's see how far this spreads. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd say she was, she was eating up. Look at that. Getting good metal right there. All right, let's get this cut out. Using an angle grinder and a four inch cutoff wheel, I make a few rough cuts to get rid of this rust. The inner structure's eating away too, so we'll have to take care of that. We'll get that replaced. But this is why these cab quarters rust out. GM puts this insulation in from the factory and it just soaks up water. So it can't help but rust out. So we yank this junk out of here and we'll have to worry about that again. To take care of these rusty cab corners that are so common on these trucks, we went over to LMC Truck and picked up this reproduction piece for the 99 through 07 GM pickups. It comes shipped E-coated and is manufactured from 18 gauge steel. Now, there's a lot of metal here, so if you've got a really bad cap corner, you can definitely use the whole piece. But since we're working with such a small section down here, we don't have to do that. I plan to temporarily mount this when I get everything ready, and I'll make a cut through this and the OEM piece at the same time. This will give me a really nice uniform line that's really nice to weld to. The secret to any rust repair is to remove only the rotted away metal. So that'll be my approach. I'll start by cutting away small sections to see what's hiding behind in an attempt to keep the repair as small as possible. But if the rust keeps going, so will my cut. And as I get further along, it's clear that the entire inner rocker is also shot. So my simple cab corner replacement has turned into a much bigger job. All right, well, we were gonna cut out about a foot section of this rocker because we know this is how long this inner structure is that we needed to replace. But as I've gotten into this thing, I've realized it is not solid metal. There is a ton of fiberglass in this. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Ooh. 
<laughs> Look at that. Well, since this was brand new metal, someone had replaced this rocker, we gave them the benefit of the doubt, but I'm not going over that, so we're gonna cut this thing out and do it proper. Now we'll just hop down the rocker looking for sparks. Wow. Well, better. That way I'll know I've got good metal and we've gotten away from the bad repair. Good metal. All right, so we'll make a cut somewhere in here. You guys doing this at home, don't be surprised if the job is a little bigger than you originally thought. Let's face it, you can't see what's behind the panel until you cut it away. And since restoration sheet metal is so inexpensive, we ordered a replacement rocker from LMC Truck as well. Both pieces were 140 bucks. And it's a good thing we rolled the dice because the previous rocker repair wouldn't have lasted past winter. <laughs> And that's why we decided to go ahead and replace the rocker. That's a good example of somebody that was just trying to mud it up and move it along to the next guy, so, yep. Next, Metal Magic. Any good metal shop is equipped with tools like these to get the job done properly. We have an English wheel that's used for shaping and smoothing out the metal, a bead roller, Self-explanatory, it rolls a bead in the metal. Can be for looks, also for strength. And you guys know what a metal break is. This is what we'll use to bend our metal up. We'll use all of these tools today to make quick work of building an inner rocker. But first, we need to pull a few measurements and start building the template. We're gonna cut away all of this rust, but I need to see how big of a piece of new sheet metal I need. At one inch on the bottom, four inches, by two inches, so I know I need a seven inch tall piece by 16 inches long. Before I even think about cutting away the rust, I'll cut a piece of chipboard to serve as a template for the replacement metal. This is way more manageable working with paper, making scissor cuts to help form the contours, which I'll replicate on the shop tools I just showed you. And once I'm happy with the fitment, I'll transfer the pattern to 18 gauge sheet metal. I like using a metal shear. No sparks, no dust, and it doesn't create any heat which distorts metal. Now onto the woodward break to make the bends in the piece. I'll make several bends right along the lines I mark. Then I can fine tune my lines with the teardrop mallet on the sandbag probably one of my favorite tools for shaping metal. You can get these mallets in various sizes and shapes for whatever you're trying to accomplish. It will take a little bit of test fitting, but remember to shape it slow. Getting close. Light blows with the hammer make a huge impact on the metal. The dimples the mallet leaves will need to be smoothed out. This is where the English wheel comes into play. I'll use the die with the heaviest crown to add a little more shape and to smooth out the metal from the mallet blow. Working it back and forth, the metal starts to take more of a smooth shape, tightening the pressure slowly. The last thing I'm going to do to the panel is trace out a bead line that was in the original OEM inner rocker. Then add the bead with the Woodward bead roller. This isn't for looks. The bead will add strength to the panel and mimic the original piece. I'll tidy up the piece by removing the surface rust. Then I can trace out my cut line on the rusted junk. If you took your truck to a reputable collision or custom shop, this would be the kind of repair you get. As they say, it's all in the details. If I were to have left that inner rust, well, <laughs> you'd call me out on it. And even with new exterior sheet metal, we'd only have a temporary repair. Next, watch your clearance, Clarence. We're back on Truck Tech, finishing up the rocker and cab corner replacement on Project Supermax. We picked up this brand new sheet metal from LMC Truck and I already cut it down to size and I'll attach it temporarily so I can make my cut line. Cutting both pieces at the same time gives me an even consistent gap even if your cut isn't completely straight. 
Leaves a nice gap for welding, too. I'll do the same with the LMC cab corner, keeping only the section I'll need. The Matco pneumatic hole punch will mimic the factory spot weld. Next, I'll clean off the E-coat with a 36 grit roll lock and sack weld it in. That's looking really good. I've got quite a bit more welding to do, but we've got all of the rust cut out of this truck. We got rid of all that factory foam and insulation GM puts in this thing, so we probably won't ever have to worry about the rust coming back. With fabricating that inner rocker, doing the cap corner repair, and the outer rocker, I've only got about eight hours in this job. So on a weekend, we'll take care of that old rusty truck. While Jeremy finishes up welding the cab corners and rocker panels together, I'm going to start by tearing down the front end of the truck to remove the front bumper. The same bed liner that's been applied to the rocker panels covers the entire front bumper and we really don't like the look of it. Now since the upper and lower surfaces are made from plastic, there's no easy way to remove it without damaging the surface underneath. Besides, we plan on color matching the entire front end of this truck when we paint it, so it'll be easier just to replace the parts altogether. But we will have to reuse the brackets to attach the new front bumper. To dress up the front end of Project Supermax, we went to LMC Truck and grabbed all new parts. Now remember we said we are going to color match the front end of this truck, so instead of grabbing a chrome bumper, we grabbed the paintable version. There is also a couple different options to choose from for the lower valance. Our truck came from the factory with cutouts for the tow hooks already in place, but we want to step it up just a little bit, so we grabbed the valance that also includes cutouts for the fog lights. Now to top it all off, we grabbed the upper trim cap, which is specific to the HD Silverados, just a little bit taller. First I'll install the old brackets onto the new bumper, then I'll temporarily install the new lower valance. Now normally I wouldn't mount the front bumper just yet. But we need to modify it a little bit because of the wheel and tire package we have planned. So it gets temporarily attached to the truck. We have some 22 inch wheels and tires that are left over from another project. And they are a similar size to the final wheel and tire package we plan on running. With the wheels turned all the way, you can see that the tires will hit the lower balance. Now you can actually run into this problem just by installing a larger diameter tire. But more often than not, the root cause of the problem is actually in the wheel. See, lately it's become a popular trend to install a wheel with a very deep dish or negative offset. Now that looks good and gives the truck a nice aggressive stance, but the problem is this. The farther the outside edge of the wheel is away from the hub, the farther forward the whole wheel and tire will swing as you make a turn. Now there's a couple different ways we could fix this. We could just come in and chop the bottom corner of the plastic lower valance, and that would make everything fit. But the problem is, well, it just looks bad from the outside of the truck. So instead, I'm going to take some fine line masking tape and make a very gradual line that comes clear up into the bumper so we'll have plenty of clearance and it'll look good at the same time. I'll use a thin cutoff disc on an angle grinder for both the plastic lower valance and the steel bumper. I'll clean up the edges with a 60 grit flap wheel, then I can check the clearance. Where are you going? Spin on around make me there. spin around. Next, one step closer to paint. When we picked up our 03 Silverado, there was no rear bumper installed. And since then, we've chopped off the rear of the frame, removing any factory mounting holes. So, for us to run a rear bumper, there's two things we need to fix. First, we went to LMC Truck and grabbed a paintable rear bumper, a center step support, and a couple of brackets. We also need a way to correctly position the rear bumper on the truck without guessing. But that's the beauty of shortening the frame in the center like we've done. Check this out. There's a small, unused factory hole in the center of each rear spring hanger. Now that just happens to line up exactly where we need to correctly position the rear bumper. We'll mount the bumper using the existing holes. Then clamp the brackets into place and drill the four larger side holes. We'll quickly spray some paint over the bare metal to prevent rust, then reinstall the bumper. We had some time to completely prime and block the bed, and it's just about ready for paint, but we need to throw it on the truck one last time to make sure everything lines up. With the tailgate installed, we're happy with the alignment and can move on. Cool. 
While LT was knocking out the bumpers, I went ahead and filler worked the rocker and cab corner we just replaced, and it's ready for primer. But in preparation for paint, we need to strip this bed liner that was sprayed on the bottom of the truck. Since this isn't a rubberized coating, we take these couple of tools and it should strip it pretty easily. If this were a rubberized bed liner or undercoating, it would only take seconds to clog up our sanding disc and they would be useless. For a rubberized coating, I would use a chemical paint stripper or a little bit of heat from a propane torch and a scraper. But for this, all we need is an 8-inch Matco sander and a Matco angle grinder, both with 36 grit, and it makes quick work of it. Before we can start running the DA to prep the surface for paint, we need to remove some of this trim. And the reason is when you do a proper color change, you want to remove these parts to make sure you get paint in behind the pieces. Not only that, we're going to sand these panels with a DA, and this will make sure we don't damage anything. We're slowly making progress on our Supermax Silverado, and this truck is fully assembled, and this is the last time you'll see it in the old Battleship Gray. And yeah, we've showed you guys many times stripping one down to bare metal and going from there, but since the rest of this truck is so nice, we're going to do what you guys would probably do at home, and I'm going to buzz this down with a DA, and I picked out a few pretty nice colors. What do you got? Since I picked these, you pick one. You know, I think we'll go for this color here. It's got some nice copper in it, some nice metallic. I think it'll fit the truck nicely. Yeah, it pops. She's blown apart and primed for pigment. Our Supermax Silverado will be scuffed and shot today with paint tips along the way. Plus, how to upgrade your steering for abuse on and off the track. Truck Tech starts now. Hey guys, welcome to Truck Tech. Today, we have Project Supermax, our 03 Silverado, in the shop, and we finally get to add some color onto this blank canvas. That's right. Not too long ago, we showed you a full custom paint job on our El Camino. We laid down candies, multiple colors, and graphics, the whole works. Today, we're not going to get that crazy. The truck's mostly going to be one color, and if we get time, we're going to lay some stripes down on that hood. Now, when it comes to picking a color for your project, there are a whole bunch of different options. Literally anything under the sun. Now, we picked something in the orange family. Now, I let LT pick the color this time, but go ahead, tell them the story why. All right, so when I was back in high school, I had a 76 C10 that I painted bright orange, and everybody loved it. So I begged and begged, and we're having an orange truck. Now, we had a rendering made up to show you what the finished project is going to look like, but where we started was so much different. This four-wheel drive HD Silverado started as a long bed powered by the LB7 Duramax. But our plans leaned towards a shorter and sportier pickup. We pulled the pin on the purchase, then immediately stripped the rear frame down to nothing, and then created something GM never thought of, a regular cab short box Duramax. This was accomplished by surgically removing a 14-inch section of the frame. Then, put it back together using parts from an extended cab short box, like the spring hangers and the fuel tank. We threw on some go fast goodies, like a four inch exhaust, downpipe, larger intercooler, and a programmer. Then threw it on the chassis dyno where it made 374 horsepower and 684 pound feet of torque. Rust repair was next, and Bumpus grafted in some new rockers and a cab corner and the junkyard bed we sourced needed some attention to fix some holes and a bad repair. Tolman prepped the underside of the bed and sprayed on some black Duplicolor rust barrier paint to protect the metal and give it a clean, low-key appearance. As you can see, we've blown everything apart to prepare for a color change, and I've got most everything masked up. Now, there are a few ways you can tackle a paint job like this. We could have stripped everything down to bare metal and then worked all the way out to our orange base coat, but not this time. It's a ton of work, but it's not always necessary. This truck's only been painted one time, and it's well within the mill thickness range for a respray. So I'm going to show you guys how we prepped all of these panels, which is how most of you would probably do it at home. So all we need Need to do now is prep the surface for good adhesion. I'm going to use our new Indasa DA or dual action sander. 
It has a built-in vacuum that is self-generating. The 320 grit sandpaper lines up with the dust ports. And the dust is collected down here in this bag, keeping everything in your shop free of debris. I'm working small sections at a time, making passes in both directions. Now this is a great way to sand a panel and save some time. And remember, all we're doing is buzzing over the panel until we get a consistent dull finish like this. You can see I've got a little more sanding to do, but I'll get this knocked out. We'll head over to the paint booth. For paint on our Duramax, we went down to Birds Automotive in Nashville, Tennessee, and they hooked us up with the Sickens line of paint. To start off with, we'll be laying down a tinted sealer. Now, what's cool about this is it can also be used as a surfacer. It just depends on what activator you add into it. We picked up two gallons of Go Mango. It's an orange with a gold pearl. Should have a nice pop. One gallon of Auto PC Clear and a gallon of activator, a couple of gallons of reducer, and a quart of adhesion promoter for those bare plastic pieces. Make sure that paint hangs on. Now, what Sickens is known for is their color match. If you pick up a chip book and pick a color, rest assured that's exactly what you're going to get. And if you do a blend job, it's going to be right on the money every time. But what I like so much about Sickens is the coverage. One to two coats of base after we lay down our tinted sealer will probably be all we need. Start by mixing up some sealer. Next, paint goes on the truck, Jeremy, not the table. Oops. We've got most of the parts of the Duramax in the paint booth, and LT's been in there finishing everything up, getting it degreased and tacked off, so we should be good to go. Now remember, we're doing a color change on this truck, so it's very important that we lay down a sealer and get a nice uniform color. So we'll get this mixed up, get in the paint booth, and pull the trigger. This orange sealer mixes three to one to one with sealer activator and sealer reducer. It takes a minute for everything to mix together, so it must be stirred thoroughly. A little check of the test pattern, and it's good to go. And I'll start by spraying the doors at about 18 PSI at the inlet of the base coat gun. I'm laying down one coat, making sure to cover all the panels evenly. What's nice about this sealer is it can also be used as a high build primer for your body work. Just use the surfacer activator and reducer instead. Okay, now we're ready to mix up our Go Mango Orange Base Coat. Now with most base coats that you're probably used to, they mix one to one with reducer. The Sickens Base Coat mixes two to one. So we're gonna get a really good coverage out of this, but it's still gonna flow really nice. Oops, that first pour out of the can can be a little bit of a doozy, but that's why we lay paper down on our tables because wherever you're mixing paint, you're probably going to spill a little bit. You don't want to ruin anything. Next is one part of Slow Reducer. Another quick check on the wall, and here we go, man, go. This base is loaded with gold pearl, so it's important to make sure good technique is used. Modeling can occur if you don't use the proper overlap or the correct distance off the panel. I like to stay about 8 to 10 inches away. And my overlap is 75%. This will ensure the pearl lays down evenly. 
The reason I told you we went with Sickens paint on this paint job is because how well their paint covers. We've only laid down one nice medium wet coat and even on the edges where the paint normally trails off and you can see through to the sealer, it's all covered and looks really good. Not only that, everything's laid out even, it's flat and we could probably lay on a coat of clear right now and be good to go. But since I want to make sure everything on this truck is perfect, we're going to lay down one more coat just to ensure everything is covered properly. We've got everything based in the booth and it's turning out great. Now it's time to lay down some clear. This is Sickens Auto Clear PC. It mixes two to one and Sickens recommends that you lay down two coats. That's exactly what we're gonna do. What's great about this clear is it slicks out right out of the gun. But if you do have to buff it, this stuff sands like butter. So we'll get some mixed up, and get it shot. The clear mixes two to one with the activator. I'll spray the clear at the recommended gun pressure, 24 PSI at the inlet with a 1.4 fluid tip. Remember, we're not going for a show winning finish. This truck will get used and abused. So we wanted to mimic the OEM finish you would see on a new truck and they roll right out of the factory with no cutting and buffing. This leaves a very durable finish that will last years. Two wet coats and we're done. Next, she'll go back together. Let me see how you do on this one. <laughs> All right, man, let's get these parts out of here and take a look at them. Wow, that is bright. <laughs> I like it. Man, that looks good. I really dig that color, man. I think that's exactly what you wanted to see. You know what? It pops. I love it. Plus, that clear coat has a nice kind of OEM orange peel to it. Yes. It looks perfect. That's what we were going for. The gold pearl is going to really pop out in the sun. All right, let's get the rest of the stuff out of the booth. Let's do it. Now that we've got everything sprayed, we'll get the cab and the parts back into the shop. We'll get the cab unmasked, start hanging the doors and fenders, and see this thing come together. Oh, yeah. Be careful back there. Some time ago, we rebuilt the front suspension on Project Supermax. And if you were paying attention, you'll notice that we didn't touch any of the steering parts. And here's why. We plan on adding a whole bunch of power to the truck. And when you do, the front parts just won't hold up. The tires want to tow in and you can actually snap a stock tie rod clear in half. And that's just unsafe. So to prevent that from happening, we went to Summit Racing and grabbed a pair of these PPE Stage 3 tie rod assemblies. Now these things are pure beef. They're much, much stronger than the factory parts and they'll hold up to whatever abuse we can throw at it, whether it be boosted launches at the drag strip or hooking it up to a sled pull. Now we also picked up some PPE idler arm and pitman arm reinforcement brackets. Now these things will go around the center link and prevent it from rocking back and forth under power. And when you combine them with the tie rods, you'll have indestructible steering. I'll start by removing two of the bolts, holding the steering gear to the frame and loosening the third. Then pivot it down so I can loosen the big nut. Next, I'll apply some heat to the pitman arm and use a puller to safely remove it from the shaft. We'll install some new OE replacement parts for the pitman arm, as well as the idler arm and pivot. We cleaned up the factory center link and it goes in next. Now for the good stuff. The PPE support brace attaches on both ends of the pitman arm using the original nut on the big side and the provided shoulder nut on the small end. This small brace goes a long way towards stabilizing the front end, keeping the tires pointed straight when you're under power. Next, the massive tie rods screw into the OE center link and are tightened up then slide into the spindle. No modifications of your factory parts are necessary to upgrade your Duramax's steering using these parts. Back when we shortened the frame on Project Supermax, there were a couple things that we didn't have time to show you. 
and the drive shaft was one of those. Now we needed to get through a dyno session pretty quickly, so I actually just shortened the original drive shaft myself. I took about 13 and a half inches off the rear. If you try to shorten a drive shaft and have a weld seam in the center, it's going to be very difficult to get the two halves to line up perfectly and balance out. So I took the extra length off the rear and took the original yoke and slid it back inside the drive shaft. Now it actually ran pretty true and it held up to about 700 pounds of torque. So we could have this drive shaft shipped off and balanced, but the tube's a little bit rusty and the U-joints have some high miles on them. So we called up Yukon Gear and Axle and ordered a brand new custom length shaft. Now this has a 31 spline yoke that'll fit perfectly in the original transfer case and it also has 1410 U-joints so it'll hold up to just about anything we can throw at it. Plus it's been high speed balanced so we don't have to worry about any vibrations from the rear end of our truck. Ahead, you think we should have called her Orange Crush? My favorite part of any project is adding new wheels and tires, because it can totally transform the look of your ride. Now with a color as bright and as loud as that orange, we need a wheel and tire that'll stand out, but we didn't want something too blingy. So we started out with some Raceline Magnitudes in a 22 by 12 with a negative 44 offset. Now the matte gray finish will nicely complement the orange paint, and the deep dish will give the truck an aggressive stance. These wheels are made using flow form technology, which gives them greater strength and impact resistance than a conventional cast wheel, making these much closer to a true forged wheel. For rubber, we went with some General Grabber UHPs, sized in a 305 45 22. Now this is a great all season sport truck and SUV tire that'll give you great traction in the wet or dry. And with a torquey diesel, traction is definitely important. Now this particular size of tire is rated to carry 2,900 pounds each, so we can still haul a decent amount of weight with that little diesel sport truck. Hey buddy, you ready for bed? I mean, I mean you, are you ready for a bed? Yeah, you want to cuddle? <laughs> hey, all I know is I've been painting a lot. I'm ready for bed. It's kind of what's on my mind right now. Let's get this thing on the truck. Looks pretty good. LT? I like it. What? Did you pick the offset of these wheels? Man, all the cool bros have a negative 44 wheel. Half the tire sticking outside of the truck. What That's about, the point. What about my paint? Well, I guess some fender flares probably are in the future for us. Uh, you know, it's probably not a bad idea, and I think it'll suit this truck well, but we've got a few more parts left to finish up this Duramax. And LMC Truck sent us over what we need to do just that. A brand new set of mirrors with the paintable caps, a tailgate handle and bezel. We'll get these plastic parts painted next time. New fog lights and a new set of tail lights all ready to go. Oh yeah, that's gonna look really nice. I'm thinking we need to call this project Supermax Orange Crush. The bright hue flashes LT back all the way to his high school days. Oh yeah. Stage one is done. Now our Supermax Silverado returns for more diesel upgrades. We'll crack open the heads and go inside the 6.6 liter Duramax and install big power adders, including LT's new little friend. That and more right now on Truck Tech. Hey guys, welcome to the shop. If you're into diesel or high performance, then today you're going to want to pay attention because we've got something for you. Yeah, you'll recognize our 2003 Silverado we've nicknamed Project Supermax, and we've made some good progress on it this season. Recently, I've taken the time to remove the engine from the truck, and I've completely torn it down to a bare short block, getting it ready to have some new parts thrown at it. Now, the goal is to have a high performance street truck that we build in multiple stages, just like you guys would do at home. Supermax started out as a single cab long bed. 
which we turn into a short bed by cutting 14 inches out of the frame. We added some Go Fast goodies and a Go Mango paint job. Now, last time you saw the truck, we just about got everything reassembled. In the front a little bit. And now we can start on stage two. Our goal is to improve on the 370 wheel horsepower that we left off with for stage one and hopefully raise that figure to just a little bit over 500. Now, yes, the engine does have 200,000 miles on it, but it spent most of its life being bone stock. And on top of that, the stock bottom ends on the LB7 are actually pretty strong. Now, when I say bottom end, I'm talking about all the rotating parts, the pistons, the connecting rods and the crankshaft. Depending on who you ask, and more importantly, who's doing the tuning, the stock bottom end will hold roughly 550 to 600 horsepower before it starts to scatter itself to pieces. Now, our goal is to push the performance envelope of the LB7. We want to get right up to that ragged edge, but we don't actually want to break anything. So, to give this engine a fighting chance, we've pulled it out of the truck and we've pulled the heads off. We're going to throw in some new gaskets and secure the heads with some studs. Next, we're going to take care of some leaks on the bottom end and replace some of those higher mile wear items. So hopefully this engine will last us another 200,000 miles. We have some new equipment in the shop and it's our Keen 900 mobile engine stand. It's designed for heavy diesel engines and can hold up to 5,000 pounds. To flip the engine, there's a three speed transmission you crank and raise the engine vertically. Then the engine can be spun and lowered back down. This stand is definitely geared towards the heavy duty side of repair. Adapters are available from anything from the 5.9 liter Cummins all the way up to the big 15 liter engines you'll see in over the road trucks. Now we also did pick up a universal rear mount adapter plate that'll hold up to a thousand pounds. Our little Duramax is definitely not pushing the limits of the stand, but it gives us a nice super stable platform to work from. The Duramax uses a two-piece oil pan that's held to the engine with several bolts and a bead of silicone. The upper cast aluminum pan has many small Allen bolts around the outside, and the flex plate has to be removed from the crank in order to access the two larger bolts that go through the bell housing and into the oil pan. With a quick pry, the pan separates. Using a 36 millimeter 12-point socket, the balancer can be removed. Cool thing about this, it's a slip fit. Pulls right off, followed by the water pump and the front timing cover. Next, I'll remove the nut from the oil pump drive gear, unscrew the pickup tube, and remove the old pump. If you're used to working on gasoline engines, things might look just a little bit different underneath the timing cover of a diesel like our Duramax, and that's because everything's driven by gears. The crankshaft turns the camshaft, which then will spin the CP3 high pressure fuel injection pump. The oil pump and the water pump, they're all driven by the same gear setup, and that's part of the reason why diesel engines will last so long. There's no timing belt or chain that could wear out or break. It can be difficult to find one place to shop for Duramax parts, but Merchant Automotive has the hookup. We were able to grab everything needed to refresh and reassemble our LB7 with just a few part numbers. We started with a high volume oil pump to keep the engine oil and a TIG welded water pump to prevent the drive gear from spinning off, which is a common problem on high performance engines. We also grabbed head gaskets and a fuel injector install kit that comes with the banjo seals and O-rings. We also grabbed all the seals needed for a complete rebuild, but Merchant Automotive also sent us replacement injector lines. LT. Yes, sir. Catch this. No. Well, that would have been bad. Thank you, sir. Next, she goes back together. We're back on Truck Tech beefing up our LB7 Duramax to handle more power. With the upgraded oil pump installed, I'll slide on the gear and use some red thread locker to make sure the left hand threaded nut won't back out. Then tighten it to 74 pound feet. Next, the pickup tube can be reinstalled. We're using Permatex Optimum Black to seal the timing cover to the front of the block. Then it can go back onto the front of the engine. 
the Merchant TIG welded water pump finishes out the front. The upper oil pan also needs silicone to form a leak-proof seal, and it too gets bolted onto the block. One major disadvantage to the factory stamped lower oil pan is this hump that sits in the bottom. It actually holds about a half a quart of oil that's never going to drain out because it's lower than the drain plug. Now this is where all the sludge and nasty stuff is going to collect and that's not something you want sitting right next to the oil pickup tube. So to help clean things up we grabbed a PPE cast aluminum lower oil pan. Now it's flat on the bottom so all the oil will always drain out and it's made from aluminum which will help dissipate heat from the oil and that'll lead to better lubrication. Now the cool thing is you can actually grab matching high capacity pans for the Allison automatic transmission and the rear differential. With a little more sealant, the new pan finishes up the bottom of the engine. The starter ring can go back onto the crank, and we're installing a new SFI certified flex plate that's much stronger than the stock one. ARP fasteners will secure the whole assembly, so a little ultra torque and thread locker are applied to the bolt. They get torqued to 250 pound feet in a circular pattern. Oh, goodness. You're going to lift me off the ground. All right, well, let's get this thing flipped and uh, get the deck cleaned up. Cool. I'll go grab some sanding stuff. Oh, you left me with this again? Give me the hard job. With the engine right side up, some rags are stuffed into the block above the lifters to keep any trash out of the engine while we clean the deck. What you laughing at? You'll see. So what we're doing here is really technically not the 100% way to do this. You know, the best way would be to strip the block down to nothing, take it to a machine shop, and have the surface decked. But that's an awful lot of expense and time just for basically doing a head gasket. Yeah, it's not always an option either. Yeah, exactly. You know, most of the times guys will be doing this actually in the truck. Um, so what we're going to do, we're just using razor blades. All we're trying to do is scrape off all that residual gasket material. Then we're going to come back in with some sandpaper and just kind of, you know, level it out. And then we're really not trying to remove material from the deck surface with the sandpaper. Just trying to basically clean it up and give it a good surface for the gasket to stick to. All right, we're ready to set the cylinder heads back down on our Duramax block. Now, anytime you add a bunch of horsepower to a diesel, you need to upgrade the head studs. So we chose ARP's Custom Age 625 head stud kit. Now, these will clamp the heads down and prevent lifting due to increased cylinder pressure. Plus, they're reusable. Here you go. Thank you, sir. With the deck surface prepped and clean, the Merchant Automotive head gaskets can go on. And the ARP head studs can be threaded in the block finger tight. Torquing them can put unwanted side load to the fasteners. I'll apply some ultra torque lube to the threads. All right, man, I got it ready for you. All right, it's a point of no return. Then carefully lower the cylinder head onto the block. Next, the washers also get some ultra torque on both sides as well as on the back sides of the nuts. The bolts are run down and torqued in a circular pattern from the center out. We're making three passes. First at 50, then at 100, and finally at 150 foot-pounds per the ARP instructions. Then the long block is finished up by torquing the four M8 bolts to 25 foot-pounds. You know, you being a diesel guy, and all I hear all day long is diesel <laughs> talk, you've got to be excited about building this. You thing. know, I'm pretty pumped because this is the first diesel engine that we've kind of tore apart, and what we have coming up next, man, that gets me so excited. I so can't wait, man. It's going to sit right here, it's going to be bright orange, <laughs> and it's going to make some pretty cool sounds. Let's get some fuel injectors in this thing. All right. Hey, LT. What's up? Grab me that spark plug wrench. What, have you got a small lawnmower that you're working on or something? <laughs> Spark hey, plugs. maybe some of you guys out there have built gas engines and not messed with mini diesels. But that's okay, they have their similarities. There's a series of pistons, you have a crankshaft, fuel goes in, exhaust goes out, and you can create some big power with these things. But there's one huge difference in a diesel, no spark plugs. All modern diesel engines use direct injection. And basically what that means is the tip of the fuel injector actually sits inside the combustion chamber. 
Now, as the piston travels up, it compresses air. Compression makes heat, and this heat is actually what ignites the air fuel mixture. So there's really no need to have any spark plugs. We're on a gasoline engine. You need a spark plug so it ignites at the right time and everything runs as it should. And you'll also notice with a diesel, these injectors, they look a little bit different, but still pretty much work the same as a gas engine. Basically, there's a small solenoid that sits on top of the injector. And as an electrical current is applied, the solenoid opens a valve and fuel is allowed to enter into the engine. Now, these things actually assemble pretty easily. First, slide a small O-ring over the fuel rail inlet fitting. These things can be a little bit tricky. Next, slide a larger O-ring over the tip of the injector and up the shaft. The purpose of this O-ring is to keep oil out of the injector cup. Finally, a copper washer seals the combustion pressure from the injector. The injector slides into the head, and with a little wiggling, it'll slip down into place, and the hold down bolt can be tightened. Next up, the fuel return line attaches to each injector with new hardware and seals from Merchant Automotive. The push rods get lubed and set in, the valve bridges go on, and the rocker assembly gets bolted into place. One unique thing about the front seal on a Duramax is there are two surfaces you have to drive into place. The inner surface rides on the crankshaft, and the outer surface sits in the timing cover. Now, you can damage the seal if you don't have the proper tools to install it. Luckily, Merchant Automotive has this front driver that sits perfectly on the crankshaft, engages with the seal, and it makes it so you can't pound it in too far. When the sound changes, that's how you know you're home. The harmonic balancer slides into place, and it will be secured by an ARP bolt torqued to 255 pound-feet. Back on the cylinder head, the valves need to get adjusted to 12 thousandths of lash using a feeler gauge until slight drag is felt. Then the adjuster nut gets tightened. I'll rotate the engine until the next pair are on base circle, make the adjustments, tighten them up, and I'll finish the other six cylinders. Next, more flow out and more flow in. During the break, we had some time to install the valve covers and the fuel injector harnesses that run underneath. That means our long block is done and it's time to move on to the fun stuff. Now, back during stage one, we upgraded the exhaust that goes from the turbo all the way to the tailpipe, but we haven't touched the pieces that go in between the engine and the turbocharger. These are high flow exhaust manifolds and up pipes from Pacific Performance Engineering. Now, these manifolds will flow 53% more air than the stock parts. And the best thing is, this whole package is carb legal, which means you can pass emissions in all 50 states. The manifolds are constructed using iron with higher levels of silicone and molybdenum, which gives them greater strength in high temperature applications. And the design will give a significant reduction in exhaust back pressure. The up pipes are made from 120 wall stainless, and the bellows are 37% larger than stock. Now, you might think it's a little bit extreme to pull the engine out of our truck just to basically change the head gaskets, add some studs, and put in an oil pump. But think about this. GM lists the book time for replacing a pair of head gaskets on a Duramax as about a 30-hour job, where it only took me about seven hours to remove the entire engine, transmission, and drivetrain from the truck. Not only that, we don't have to worry about scratching the paint, and we have a ton of room to work. Don't forget, if you want to change an oil pump in the truck, you've got to pull the front differential out. All the work we've done today has been leading up to this. A Borg Warner S300 turbo kit that we picked up from Scream and Diesel Performance. Now this charger is going to have the airflow that we need to support our horsepower goals, and even more when we finally build the bottom end of this Duramax. There are lots of ways to make your car or truck stand out in the crowd. It can be as simple as a new set of wheels, suspension upgrades, or body mods. But one thing that stands out more than anything is custom paint. I know there's that word again, paint. 
Now, most shy away from DIY when it comes to paint, but seriously, there is nothing to be afraid of. So today, I'm going to show you how a simple paint accent can give your ride that cool factor it deserves. Not too long ago, we got Project Supermax sprayed in a very bright Go Mango Orange. We actually did the entire truck top to bottom, but left the hood for later. Well, last night, I gave it a couple of coats of orange and got it ready to add some of that cool factor I'm talking about. We picked this hood up from RK Sport. It has dual scoops and it's a functional hood. And we've taken a little bit of time to test fit it onto the truck and it fit perfectly right out of the box. So now we're going to utilize the shape of this hood and add stripes on top of each scoop. Here's our Supermax Silverado with all of the panels on. And when picking an accent color, think about the theme you already have. The biggest focal point to me is the charcoal wheels. But once the truck starts to get assembled, we'll have some black trim throughout, so it kind of gives you two options for what you could do. But I think if we went black, it would clash a little too much with the wheels. So we're going to go with the charcoal and kind of tie it all together. Just think about when you get dressed in the morning. You want to match, right? Well, just think about your truck the same way. Now onto the fun part, laying down the tape for the graphics. Now if you use regular 3 quarter inch masking tape like this, there's a good chance you won't get a nice sharp clean edge. We want to make sure we use a fine line tape, and for this I'll be using a quarter inch. The quarter inch is easy to work with to get a straight line, and the thinner tapes work great for curves. I'll lay down some masking paper to protect the paint. Now I can lay down three coats of charcoal for our accent color. After about a 15 minute flash time, the hood can be unmasked. All right, here's a tip when you go to pull off your fine line tape, pull down and away from the paint you just sprayed. The edge of the tape is so sharp, you can utilize that to make sure you get a nice, clean, crisp edge. Well, there you go. Picking the right color that complements your ride and a simple paint accent can make all the difference in the world. Well, I've still got a little clear coat to lay down. Project Supermax is about to become one screaming diesel. Today, our 6.6 .6 Duramax will get power to the ground with this built transmission. And after an easy upgrade to the transfer case, we'll turn the crank on all our newfound power. It's diesel day, right now on Truck Tech. Hey guys, welcome to the shop. Today, we're back on Project Supermax, our 2003 single cab short bed diesel powered sport truck. Now we are making great progress on this truck. It's painted, it's assembled, and it's looking good. In fact, we are very close to the finish line on this build. In fact, today is the last day that you'll see us working on it in the shop, because next time, we're hitting the road. Now recently we've had the engine out. We freshened it up with some new head gaskets and head studs. And we just finished up installing our Screamin' Diesel S366 single turbo kit. But we still haven't installed the transmission yet, so that'll be the first thing that we take care of today. And we have a couple other upgrades that we're going to do to finish up stage two of our high performance diesel build. If you're serious about upgrading the performance of your Duramax, then a built transmission is a must. We picked up this bad boy from Screamin' Diesel Performance, and first of all, it just looks awesome. We had it powder coated in the same illusion orange as the rest of the turbo kit, so it'll all go together nicely. But its beauty is more than just skin deep, because this transmission is rated to hold 750 horsepower, and it's built to last. It has upgraded clutches and a modified hydraulic system that'll give you more fluid pressure and better shifts. Plus, a cool thing is they actually use 2011 and newer Allison C3 and C4 clutch pistons. They have a stronger spring, so it'll give you a quicker release of the clutch pack, giving you a better quality shift. The torque converter is the main coupling between the engine and transmission, and it's important that you choose the right one to match your power level and your intended usage. This one is built by Gearend specifically to match Screamin' Diesel Performance's specs. It has a 2200 RPM stall speed and a triple disc lockup clutch. It has a billet front cover, but most important is what's inside. This one has a billet stator. 
Now, if you plan on using your truck in four wheel drive, like doing sled pulls or boosted launches, the billet stator is an important upgrade because the stock one just won't be able to handle that level of abuse. SDP sent us a bunch of new parts that go inside their transmissions and a bunch of failed original parts, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about these later on. But first, we want to get started and install that new transmission. With every converter we install, we always pre-fill it with fluid before putting it in the trans to prevent dry startup. Because of its size, this one can take just about two quarts. When installing the converter into the trans, there are three distinct clunks to listen for. The input shaft, the stator support, and finally, the pump. I'll bring in the jack, and since the Allison weighs about 320 pounds by itself, plus another 75 for the converter, we'll use our crane to lift the trans onto the jack, and I'll secure it with a ratchet strap. Next, the truck goes up in the air, and the trans can be wheeled in. It's important that both dowel pins are installed in the engine to line everything up. There are nine bolts that hold the trans to the engine, and many are hard to reach, but resist the temptation to leave one or two out. Bugger. With the right combination of wrenches, extensions, and a long reach, they all can be installed. The worst thing about being on TV is they put all these darn lights in a warm place up. We picked up a new urethane transmission mount from Merchant Automotive that'll match nicely with our urethane motor mounts. And the cross member can be installed. Now you might be wondering, why did I install a brand new transmission and have this old rusted out cross member? Well, check this out, it's actually not rust. All gone. With the bolts tightened, this SDP 750 Allison has moved permanently into its new home. Stay tuned, upgrading the transfer case is next. I've got the Allison installed in the truck, it's wired up, and we're pretty much ready to go. It doesn't matter if you have a 500 horsepower daily driver or an 1800 horsepower race truck. SDP can custom build you an Allison automatic that'll suit your needs. So I just wanted to take a couple quick minutes and show you guys some of the cool things that go on inside an Allison and how the upgrades will help it stand up to more power. And the first is actually pretty simple. It's just a PTO cover. Now this one's made from billet aluminum and has a fluid guide that's been machined into the back. There's a left and a right side. Now this guide works in conjunction with a machine transmission case and it helps sling extra fluid onto the C3 clutch pack. Now this is super important because the C3 is the hardest working clutch in the transmission. So it can definitely benefit from the extra fluid. Now one of the weakest parts of the Allison Automatic is the C2 clutch hub. Now to get the 750 horsepower rating, our truck has a billet C2 replacement, but a more affordable option can be had. This sleeve presses onto the outside of the hub and it gives it a rating of 650 horsepower. Basically it just clamps together the splines, preventing them from deforming under power. Of course, you're going to need a modified P1 sun gear that's been machined to have the extra clearance to fit around the sleeve. Any clutch in any automatic transmission is basically just alternating layers of steel and friction material, and they're clamped together by hydraulic fluid pressure. Now this is an example of a failed clutch. Basically it's had too much power pushed through it so it slips. That slipping creates heat which burns off all the friction surface. You can really tell the difference side by side with a brand new clutch. So in any automatic transmission there are three different ways that you can increase its holding capacity. Number one, use just a better friction material. These are Rebestus GPZ. Number two, you can actually increase the surface area of the clutch. This is done by adding one additional disc in the C2 and two additional discs in the C3 pack. And the third thing you can do is just increase the fluid pressure that clamps down on those clutch discs, preventing from going anywhere. Now the next thing for us is the transfer case, but we get a couple upgrades we're gonna do inside it before it goes back in the truck. Our truck uses a new process 263 XHD transfer case, which is a very strong piece. It's made from magnesium, is chain driven, and has a 272 to one low range. Overall, it's a very strong piece, and it'll hold up to all the mechanical abuse we can throw at it, even with the power upgrades of the engine. But it does have an Achilles heel, which can wipe out all the bearings in the case. 
This is the oil pump and it's made from aluminum, which is a harder material than the magnesium housing. And here's the problem. These four little lugs actually index it into the back of the case, but they're very thin. And over time, the oil pump can actually rattle back and forth, which can cut a hole in the back of the housing. Now, luckily, ours hasn't worn out yet. This is a pump upgrade kit from Merchant Automotive. Now, it won't fix your problem if it's already worn through the case, but the lugs are so much wider that when it properly indexes into the back of the case, it won't move around and it'll prevent the problem from ever happening in the first place. There are a few T15 screws that get removed, and the original pump housing can be pulled and set aside. I'll clean the pump and screws with brake cleaner and set both pump gears into the body. A little oil will help with initial lubrication. Then the Merchant Automotive upgraded pump housing can be installed. The provided thread locker makes sure the screws won't back out. Then the pump can be reinstalled onto the output shaft and lined up with the pickup tube. Next is the reluctor wheel, followed by the bearing and a snap ring. I'll clean up the mating surfaces of the transfer case. Now, when you're doing this, you actually don't want to wear off this textured surface, because that actually helps the silicone bite in and make a good seal. And apply some silicone sealant. The rear case slides back on with a few gentle taps. The rear snap ring is re-engaged through the access port, and all the factory hardware is reinstalled. Up next, guess how many quarts our new transmission takes? We're back on Truck Tech, finishing up the drivetrain of our 6.6 liter Duramax. This is stage two of our upgrades. Basically, we're going from 370 horsepower at the wheels to what we hope will be well over 550. All thanks to a bigger turbo, a built trans, and some custom tuning. The last upgrade we're gonna do to our driveline is this transmission rear housing support brace that we picked up from Merchant Automotive. Now, luckily, they come powder-coated orange to match the rest of our truck, and it installs pretty easily. It slides into place on top of the transmission, and it's secured with four bolts on the transmission side and two on the transfer case. The rear drive shaft slides back into place, and we're making some good progress. Anytime you add more power through an automatic transmission, it's gonna generate more heat in the fluid. Now, the factory cooler does an okay job at stock power levels, but we plan on more than doubling our horsepower output, so the stock cooler just isn't gonna cut it. We went to Pacific Performance Engineering and grabbed this Bolton replacement transmission cooler. Now, it has 60% more surface area than the stock cooler, which means it can pull an additional 20 to 30 degrees of temperature out of the fluid. Now, this works perfect if you're towing heavy loads or you're racing or just out having fun. Now, we can connect this up to the factory transmission cooler lines, but ours had 200,000 miles on them and they were already starting to leak. Plus, the new transmission will have just a little bit more line pressure, so we're not going to take any chances. We went to Screaming Diesel Performance and picked up their transmission cooler line kit. Now, this stuff is basically hydraulic hose, and it's rated to just over 2300 PSI. So we know it's definitely going to hold up, and it will never leak or leave us stranded. We'll get started by putting some fittings into the transmission. The O-ring fittings thread right into place, and I'll slide in the lines beside the engine and connect them to the transmission. It's time to get the truck back on the ground. Hey, John, give me a hand, would you? I'm right here. <laughs> All right, let's get this hood off. There we go. Up. It's a race hood. Quick release. It's not. <laughs> All right, man. thanks, buddy. No bro. Next, I'll remove the grill. The PPE upper bracket bolts into place in the original holes underneath the hood latch, and the cooler is attached. Next, the lower bracket attaches to the support beam, and the hoses can be hooked up. Lastly, make some connections at the radiator. Now you want to talk with your builder on what type of fluid to put in the transmission. From the factory, these Allison's call for a DEX-6, 
Now this particular transmission with the type of clutches that are in it, we gotta run a DEX 3 and a whole bunch of it. All in with this transmission, the larger cooler and extra capacity pan, our Allison is gonna take 22 quarts of fluid. Are you ready? Next, with everything topped off, LT gets his shift together. We're back on Truck Tech, finishing up some last minute details on our Supermax diesel build. The rear axle that came underneath our truck is more than strong enough to support 500 horsepower. That's nasty. So, all we're doing is changing out the fluid. I'll clean up the mating surface, rinse out the housing with brake cleaner, and install a PPE cast differential cover. The aluminum helps dissipate the heat and it holds more fluid. All told, we need four quarts. Very childish. I was thinking some funny jokes I could I put really in there. <laughs> Our original hitch was long gone, and since this is a truck after all, we still need to be able to tow with it. We went to Summit Racing and picked up this Class 4 hitch that bolts in using the factory holes. The Class 4 rating means we can run up to 1,000 pounds of tongue weight and 10,000 pounds of trailer, which is probably more than we'd want to haul with a short wheelbase truck anyway. With our receiver firmly attached to the truck, we need a way to make sure our ball mount isn't going to disappear on us. So we went to Bolt Lock and grabbed a receiver lock. It works with your truck's ignition key. Simply stick it in and give it a twist, and it'll automatically program itself to your truck's ignition key. And the same goes for their paddle lock, cable lock, and other lock products for one key convenience. Now it's made from stainless steel and is weatherproof. Plus, they have models for all popular types of trucks. Well, the truck is 100% put back together and we're ready to fire it up. Now, when we installed the transmission, we filled up the fluid to the level on the dipstick. Now, as soon as we fire up the engine, that's gonna change. With the wheels off the ground, I like to put the truck in gear, let the wheels turn, and the transmission shift a few gears. Then use the brakes to stop it and shift it into reverse and let it turn some more. This will pump fluid through all the clutch pistons so we can get an accurate fluid level. Overall, I'm pretty happy. It's sounding good. It took a minute for the motor to crank up just because this is a fresh build and there's air in the fuel system. Now, the power steering is winding just a little bit, but it's probably low on fluid. We'll have to check the coolant and everything else, but overall, we're in good shape. Remember, on an automatic transmission, you have to check the fluid with the truck running. Well, right in the middle of the notches. Now, the last thing that we need to do is reset the adaptive learning in the TCM. Basically, this is going to make the computer understand and learn the new transmission. Now, as far as this truck goes, it's done. So the next time you guys see it, we'll be out on the road tearing it up. So you've just finished rebuilding your dream truck. Dying to get her out and burn some balonies? Hold on! We'll show you the proper way to nut and bolt your project and painting plastic for a factory look. That and more right now on Truck Tech. One of my favorite things about building vehicles is that there are so many different ways you can customize them to meet your own personal taste. Whether it's how it looks, how it sounds, or how it performs. And this 03 Silverado is a perfect example of that. All the choices that we made were based off of our own personal tastes and likes. Everything from the color and the paint scheme, the wheels and tires, and the performance underneath the hood. But there is one thing that still doesn't look quite right in our opinion, and that is up front. We've already changed quite a bit on the front end of the truck. When it came from the factory, the lower valance was gray, the metal center part of the bumper was chrome, and the top cap was black. Now this horseshoe shape on the grill was actually gray, but a different shade than the lower valance. Now the center strip on the grill was chrome, and the bow tie was kind of a weird goldish yellow color. There was a whole lot going on there that didn't really make any sense. So we already painted the grill, and it looks a lot better. 
but this black bumper cap just kind of sticks out like a sore thumb because there are no other black themes on the outside of the truck. Now, I don't mind the lower valance being gray because it ties in nicely with the bow tie, the hood, and the wheels. So we're going to take care of this upper bumper cap by painting it orange to match the rest of the truck. It is a bit different getting plastic ready to paint. And if the surface is prepared improperly, you won't be able to get the paint to stick and it'll end up just flaking off down the road. So today we're gonna show you what it takes to do it properly. Now, some of the steps are similar to painting metal, but the first few steps are different and that's where it counts. When plastic parts like this are manufactured on the assembly line, they're injected into a mold that contains a release agent so they don't stick. Now, the problem is that release agent doesn't like to stick to paint and paint doesn't like to stick to it. So before I do any scuffing of the surface, I'm gonna clean it up with a wax and grease remover. I put my gloves on. Instead of using coarse sandpaper that would just ruin the texture of the plastic, we need the surface to be thoroughly scuffed with a red Scotch-Brite pad. This will give the paint some mechanical adhesion, but simply scuffing it isn't enough. Next is probably the most important step of painting plastic. We need to give it some chemical adhesion since most standard paints won't stick directly to plastic. So we're going to apply a coat of adhesion-promoting primer. This is a clear product that will chemically bond to the base plastic and give it a good surface for the next coat to stick to. It goes on clear and requires two coats. After a 10 minute flash, we can move on. With the adhesion promoter laid down, the process from here on out is very similar to painting anything else. And I'm gonna start by putting down some gray sealer. This will basically cover up all that black plastic, requiring fewer coats of color to get even coverage. Now, as always, follow your manufacturer's recommended instructions for mixing ratios and for recoat windows. This gray catalyzed epoxy sealer mixes two to one with activator. And all it takes is a single coat to cover up the black plastic. And after waiting an hour for it to kick off, I'll mix up the Go Man Go Orange at a ratio of two to one per the instructions for maximum coverage. You know, scientific studies have shown that if you stir your paint clockwise and then counterclockwise, it lays down better. Really? No. I'll apply three coats, waiting 10 minutes in between each layer. After a 30 minute flash time for the base, I can move on to the clear. It mixes four to one to one. All it takes is two coats and it can dry overnight. Next, fixing Supermax's weak link. While the paint on our bumper cap dries, I've got Project Supermax back in the shop for what I promise will be the last time before we finally get this thing out on a drag strip for a proper payoff of those stage two performance modifications. Now I've got about 100 miles on this truck since we put in the new transmission and I just got the front end aligned and everything actually seems to drive pretty straight and smooth, but I don't want any surprises. So I'm gonna show you guys what we usually do for a final nut and bolt inspection of a project of this caliber. I'll get the truck up on the lift for a nut and bolt recheck, specifically focusing on the suspension, braking, and steering systems. One of my favorite tools to use when building a project like this is actually a paint marker. Now you can see on the suspension and brakes, I've put a couple different lines between the head of the bolt and whatever it's attached to. Now this will actually do a couple different things for me. Number one, if I have to put down the project and come back in a couple days or even weeks, I can quickly tell what I've tightened and what I haven't. And number two, if a couple weeks or months go by after you put some miles on the project and you want to give it a once over, you can quickly tell if the bolts have backed out or not simply by looking at the mark. If it still lines up, you're good to go. Now, not everybody wants to mark up the bottom side of their truck, especially if you're building a high-end show vehicle. So I'm going to show you some of the critical fasteners that I always double check before shipping a project out the door. I'll start with the brake caliper bolts, as well as the caliper brackets and the bolts that hold the unit bearing into the spindle. Next are the lower and upper ball joint bolts, as well as the lower control arm bolt. Basically any fastener that's attached to a moving suspension part. 
We just had the front end aligned at a local tire shop, so I'm going to double check the cam bolts to make sure they're tight. It's especially important to mark these for position on this truck because the four-wheel drive launches we plan on doing can get pretty harsh, so I need to be able to tell at a glance if they get moved. Out back, the important things to check are the front leaf spring bolts, which I already tightened but forgot to mark, the shackle bolts, as well as the U-bolts under the axle. Checking the rear brakes, I found a small leak on the right rear brake line, so a quick snug up should take care of it. If you watch our shows, then you'll probably recognize this as the original steering center link from our truck. And if you look closely, you can tell that it's actually bent. So how the heck do we bend a big center link like that on a three quarter ton truck? Well, when I took it outside and did its first shakedown run, I went in the parking lot and did a four wheel drive boosted launch. Now when that happens, the front end of the truck raises up, causing the angle between the tie rod and the center link to get sharper. Now this puts extra leverage on the center link, causing it to bend. Now we already upgraded the tie rods, so the center link was the next weakest part. And Duramaxes are notorious for bending and breaking front end parts. So here is how we fixed it. This is a straight race center link that we picked up from PPE and it's attached to a pitman arm with an oversized 7 8 inch pivot and on the other side a billet aluminum idler arm with the same big pivot. Now when we combine that with our stage 3 tie rods that we already installed we should have bulletproof steering. Now I also had to lower the ride height of the suspension just a little bit by adjusting the torsion arm bolts. That'll give us a flat angle between the tie rod and the center link. Now with the nut and bolt inspection done and our upgraded steering this truck is ready to hit the track. With the clear coat dried on our bumper cover, we can snap it back on the truck. Well, I have to say, I think it looks really good being orange instead of black. Now, if you look really closely, you can see the texture of the plastic still comes through the paint. Now, I'm okay with that for a work style truck like this, but if you want it to be perfectly flat, you can lay down some high build primer after the adhesion promoter and block it perfectly smooth. For me, I'll get the rest of this grill together. The Duramax diesel is a joint venture between General Motors and Isuzu, and they've been manufactured in Moraine, Ohio since 2001, when they first started putting them in HD Silverados and Sierras. Now, there have been several different versions throughout the years, but they're all 6.6 liter, 32 valve, single turbo diesel V8s. Now, they started with the LB7, moved on to the LLY, and the LBZ, which many considered to be the best pre-emissions diesel out there. Then came the LMM, the LML, and lastly, the L5P, which was just introduced in the 2017 trucks. Now, all Duramax V8s use high pressure common rail fuel injection, which means the trucks are great for a tow rig, a fuel efficient daily driver, or even in high performance applications like we have here. But there is one small issue that plagued the earliest Duramaxes, making potential buyers just a little bit wary. Our truck uses the LB7, which is the earliest version of the Duramax. Power numbers come in at 300 horse and 520 pounds of torque. The compression ratio is 17 and a half to one, and this is actually the only Duramax that came from the factory with a waste gated turbo. The LLYs and newer, they all came with a variable geometry turbo. Now these engines are pretty reliable. They can regularly go well over three or even 400,000 miles without any major internal problems. But the LB7 is known for a particular fault, and that's the fuel injectors. And when they go bad, it can be a very costly repair. So I'm gonna show you how to spot a set of failing injectors, whether you own a truck already or you're looking to buy one. When you first start up the truck, look at the tailpipe and pay attention to what comes out. If you see gray or black smoke, that means too much fuel is going through the engine and it could be caused by a faulty injector. Now there is a more scientific method for spotting a faulty fuel injector. Now you can even narrow it down to a particular cylinder. When I go to look at a truck, I always bring around a laptop or a scan tool so I can log a parameter called cylinder balancing rate or injector balancing rate. You can kind of think of it like a fuel trim for each individual cylinder. With the truck up to temperature, we need to find the balancing rates. GM lists an acceptable range between positive and negative four cubic millimeters of fuel. The only other thing we have to check is that the total fuel rate comes in right around eight cubic millimeters. All our injectors check out. 
Now I know not everybody has their own laptop scan tool, but if you're gonna go buy a truck, bring along a buddy who has one or go get it checked out by a mechanic because an individual fuel injector for a Duramax can cost a couple hundred bucks and you definitely don't want that surprise repair bill. Today, our Stage 2 Diesel Beast Project Supermax hits every inch of pavement, from the street to the strip, even to the dyno. See how much power and performance can be unleashed. It's happening right now on Truck Tech. Hey guys, welcome to Truck Tech and US 43 Dragway in Etheridge, Tennessee. Today, our buddies Pat and Mike have invited me down along with a couple of our other buddies for a little shootout. So we figured this would be the perfect opportunity to get Project Supermax out of the shop and onto the track. Now I'm super excited because this truck has been a long time in the making and today is the first day we really get to get it out on the road, out on the track and maybe burn a little bit of rubber. Okay, maybe a lot of rubber. Now remember, GM won't sell you a three-quarter ton short bed diesel truck. That's why we had to build our own. We started out with a single cab long bed that had admittedly seen better days. Mechanically, it was exactly what we're looking for. We got it back to the shop and immediately started tearing it down to a bare frame to begin our short bed conversion. It was a tedious task that a lot of guys can relate to, but in just a few hours, all right. we could begin planning a frame dissection. 14 inches were removed from the center, and it slid back together using the original factory double overlap. Extra care was taken to make sure the frame was level, square, and straight, so that the truck will drive straight down the road and not all cattywampus. Yeah, I'm gonna put it right there. With that shorter stance taken care of, it was time to turn our attention to the power department, my favorite part because after all, you can't have a cool shorty diesel truck if she's stock underneath that hood. Stage one of our plan included all the basic mods diesel guys do. We started with a larger intercooler to keep EGTs low, a three inch high flow downpipe that connected to a four inch dual exhaust, cold air intake, and a programmer. With these simple modifications, Supermax made a best of 374 horsepower at the rear wheels but that's nowhere near enough power. So a little later on, we yanked the motor out and tore it down to the bare short block so we could install some new head gaskets and studs and prepare the bottom end for some serious cylinder pressure. High flow exhaust manifolds and up pipes connect to a T4 turbo pedestal. And on top sits an SDP S366 SXE turbocharger. We upgraded the Y-bridge and both charge pipes to three inch pieces, and the turbo intake measures in at four. To back up all that torque the LB7's making and put it to the ground, we installed a 2000 RPM stall speed converter that's mated to an SDP Allison that's built to handle 750 horsepower. Later on, we'll show you what kind of power this thing put down on the dyno. <laughs> Believe me, this thing just screams. But you can't be all about the high performance. The truck has to look the part as well. Now, believe me, we had our work cut out for us to transform this truck from that battleship gray worker she was into the bright orange beauty that she is today. Jeremy started by cutting out all the rust on the rockers and cab corners and replacing it with some new solid sheet metal. We blew the entire truck apart and did a color change from the dull gray to a zesty Sickens Go Man Go orange. Gray racing stripes were added to the hood and the front end was color matched for a modern look. And I'd say we nailed it. We've got a powerful, good looking sport truck that can haul a boat or just plain haul the mail. And today we're gonna put Project Supermax through its paces. Next, a performance turbo system calls for a multi-stage custom tune. And later on, we'll dial her in for max power. Oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, oh. Are you ready? I'm ready? We're back on Truck Tech at US 43 Dragway in Etheridge, Tennessee, where with Pat and Mike is part of their barbecue and burnouts tour. Now I can't wait to get this diesel truck down on the start line, spool her up and make a couple hits. 
we're sort of piggybacking on this inaugural event that brings fellow gearheads together for a little friendly competition. The Eighth of a Mile Strip is the perfect venue for their season-ending project. This 62 Nova sporting a 588 cubic inch big block. And for us, we'll be able to push the Duramax. Maybe not to its limits, but certainly hard enough to see how we did with our Stage 2 upgrades on the LB7. You've heard a lot in the news lately about clean diesel. Now, low sulfur fuels, advanced engine controls, and emissions technology help modern trucks run and produce nearly zero emissions output, and they'll run smoke-free. So when it came time to apply a custom, high-performance tune to our Silverado, we called PPEI Tuning from Lake Charles, Louisiana. They have tuned literally thousands of diesels, ranging from simple bolt-on daily drivers, full-on race trucks, tow rigs, and ones like this, a twin-turbo LML street truck. And one thing PPEI specializes in is clean tuning. They don't build smoke tubes, and they certainly won't make your truck roll coal. But they will tune it to optimize power, drivability, transmission shifting, and fuel mileage. Our stage two round of high performance modifications is done. Now everything that we've installed under the hood, like the larger turbo and charge pipes, intercooler, Y-bridge, exhaust manifolds, nut pipes, all that stuff is going to increase airflow into and out of the engine. Now that's going to make it more efficient, reduce exhaust gas temperatures, and increase horsepower. But to really get the most for our money and increase horsepower, we need to have this truck tuned. We got together with PPEI and gave them a list of all the upgrades that we've done to our truck. Basically anything that's going to affect airflow, the fuel system, even tire size and gear ratio. They put together a couple custom tunes for us that'll work on this truck in nearly any situation, whether we're daily driving it, towing, or even just racing. Now, on an LB7, the tunes are gonna come preloaded in an AutoCal device like this, and all it takes is a few simple steps to get those tunes plugged into your truck. Just connect the cord to the OBD2 port underneath the dash, and turn on the key. Select the options you want and follow the on-screen commands. With the calibration loading, we're just a couple minutes away from having a whole bunch of horsepower. Our AutoCal actually came with five different power levels on it, so we installed a DSP or Duramax selectable programming switch right on the dashboard. That'll let us cycle between the five different power levels, just like we're turning up the volume on a radio. Number one comes in at a 30 horse optimized stock or economy tune. Number two is a 60 horse tow tune. Number three is a 120 horse street tune. Number four is a 180 horse tune. And number five is a 230 to 250 horse max effort race tune. Now that is going to be fun. PPEI offers tuning for 01 to 16 Duramaxes, 2006 and newer Cummins trucks, 2011 and newer 6.7 Power Stroke trucks, and the Ram 1500 Eco Diesel. Now on the newer vehicles, they even offer tuning on the EasyLink setup. That's basically a Wi-Fi enabled tuning platform that'll let you get updates and data log right over the cloud. Now for us, it's time to get this truck out on the road. Now we're getting closer to being able to make another run down the eighth mile track. Now there's no way that this truck will be able to compete with a group of cars that we have running here today. This thing weighs over 5,500 pounds. But don't forget, we built this truck to be used as a daily driver. And that's exactly how we first tested her out on the streets. Co-host Mark Chris from Detroit Muscle joined me for the Silverado's first shakedown run. All right, man, what do you think? Well. I guess we're gonna go tow something, right? <laughs> well, my main goal here is I wanna get everybody converted onto the diesel bandwagon. I like diesels. The only really trucks that I've been in that were hopped up per se were late model diesel trucks that had like a tune. So. Okay. I know this thing has a bit more than that. It's, it's got a few parts thrown at it. So you said this is a uh, stage two build. What, what does that consist of? Like, what'd you have to do to get there? Yeah, so stage one for most diesel guys is pretty much a programmer, some kind of an intake and exhaust. So we went a little bit further than that. You know, I would equate this to a fully bolted on uh, muscle car, right? Instead of more like a naturally aspirated, carbureted small block Chevy, it's more of like a 2003, 03, 04 Cobra 
Exactly. That's that's a very good analogy. You know, you take the Cobra, you pull it down, you spin the blower faster, you know, go through the exhaust, basically get air in and get air out more quicker and more efficiently, and there's where your power's from. Have I got you converted yet to the diesel bandwagon? I think you just did. <laughs> All right. I think you just did. It's one thing to feel the power. It's another to know exactly what numbers you're putting down to the wheels. We moved over to the engine power shop and their chassis dyno to get some accurate horsepower and torque readings with our PPEI custom tune. All right, guys, she made 374 at the wheels at the end of our stage one mods, so I've got it on the lowest tune, so hopefully we're at least 375. Okay. All right. I have no idea what it's gonna do, to tell you the truth. It may blow up. All right, let her buck. You ready? How'd we do? All right, first bang. That one is 346. Uh oh. But uh, 511 pound feet of torque. Well, actually, you know what? That kind of makes sense because 374 was actually our maximum on the old tuner. Right, right, right. right. This is just an optimized stock tune. <laughs> So that's actually pretty good. Yeah, it's not bad. Pull, yeah, I know it's hard to get the load right on this. We, yeah. it, it's loading like it should, but trying to build boosts is a little bit difficult. Go ahead and, um, I, what, now what are you gonna do with this? You well, gotta, let, let's skip the toe tune and go right to number three. Okay. See yeah. what it'll do. Okay, you don't have to change like jets or air bleeds or anything, do you? Check this out. <laughs> There's a whole bunch more power just uh, like that. I see. Holy Christ. What do we do? 492 on power, Woo! 761 pound feet. <laughs> that's, oh. that, that's bizarre, because I don't know what you did in there, but uh, it just picked up power like. It's just like turning up the volume on your radio. I need to see this knob. I want one of these <laughs> in my truck. There you go. That's awesome. All right. At this point, we'll skip the second street tune and go right to number five, max power. Oh, oh, are you ready? I'm ready. 553. Okay. 952. <laughs> now we can we can do this all day because you're, you're you're I mean. Look at that. Holy cow! Look at that torque. Yeah. What what kind of cylinder pressure is that thing making to make that, that kind of torque at 2,800 RPM? That's pretty serious stuff. Now, uh, how much boost is that? About 38 pounds of boost. I, I, I can feel that he's a little excited. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can hear it. This is awesome. Uh, oh, I love it. Right, you know what? What do you think? You guys can buy a diesel yet? Uh, no. Come on. <laughs> think about what we can make on 35 pounds of boost. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, oh rub it in. No, rub man. It in. Nice, very nice job, man. We're back on Truck Tech, about to have a little fun at US 43 Dragway with a bunch of our friends. Remember, we've got five tunes to play with in Project Supermax. And we can dial them in on the fly. Well, this is the very first pass that we're gonna make down the drag strip in this truck. I've got it on tune number three and the truck's two-wheel drive right now. So we're gonna see how it does, how it reacts, and maybe turn it up from there. All right, that first run wasn't too bad. We did a 9.2 at 82 miles per hour, and that was on tune number three. So we definitely have a little bit more power to go. Now the trick is putting all that power to the ground. But the cool thing about this diesel truck is a huge cooling system. We've been hot lapping it for a little while here, and the temperature is 172 degrees, so we don't have any worries about it. So I'm gonna try a couple more passes on tune number three, see if I can get it to stick a little bit better just by varying the technique of how I launch out of the hole. Next, we're gonna crank her up to tune number four and see if we can get it to stick on the launch. It turns out street radios aren't meant for drag strip grip and the massive diesel torque just spins the tires, but it does lead to a little faster 914 at 83 miles per hour. The trouble I'm having is traction. This thing just wants to spin and spin and spin with all that torque. But here's the cool thing. This is a four wheel drive truck. So I can just reach down, switch it into four wheel drive, and I'm gonna tune it to tune number five. So hopefully by launching in four wheel drive, I can put all that extra power down to the ground, get out of the hole quicker, and get a little bit better mile per hour. We'll see what happens, I guess. 
On the first attempt, I foot braked it up to 15 PSI and let it rip, which turned out to be a bit much. It spun the front wheels and shook pretty bad, which unloaded the suspension, so I had to pedal it, which resulted in a 905 at 82 miles per hour. On the next attempt, I boosted her to only 10 PSI, and it still spun, but not as bad. On the last run, I launched it just a bit softer on six pounds, and she hooked up and boogied down the track at an 819 at 85 miles per hour. Not too bad for a heavy three-quarter ton truck. All right, LT's Duramax, it turned out awesome. Not just looks, but the thing actually performs well at the drag strip in two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. Seeing something like that go down the track that weighs that much and it's a diesel is pretty impressive. LT and Jeremy did a killer job. I am very impressed with how our little orange truck did today, even on these street tires. Now, even in four-wheel drive, it's still a little bit of a challenge to put all that power down. She still wants to spin, but that's okay. This is not a dedicated drag truck. You can drag race it though. You can show it, you can drive it to work, you can pull the boat. I mean, you can just have fun with it. This makes me want to build a dedicated twin turbo diesel drag racer.